content, so I would like to introduce Grace Horner, who will be giving our introduction today. And Grace is a Presidential Management Fellow currently with the USA Bureau for Food Security's Monitoring, Evaluation, and Learning Team. And her home position is with the US Global Development Lab's Center for Development Innovation. So Grace will kick us off. Thank you all for joining us today, um, both in person and virtually, to discuss um, monitoring and evaluation of gender in agricultural and food security projects, and particularly the Women's Empowerment in Agriculture Index, or the WIA, as you will hear it re referred to throughout the day. Um, so I know some of you are very familiar with the WIA, perhaps uh, using the data in your own programming or even collecting it yourself, while for others of you, uh, this may be the first time that you're learning about the tool. Um, so as kind of an introduction for the WIA novices, um, despite um, the very prominent role that women play in agriculture in many developing countries, there are persistent gender gaps in access to productive resources, in group membership, in time availability, in social norms around decision making. And yet, at the same time, there is consistent and compelling evidence of the strong linkages between women's empowerment and agricultural productivity. It is estimated that if women had the same access to agricultural resources that men do, they could increase their yields by 20 to 30 percent. So the good news is that that represents a great opportunity to raise overall agricultural output uh, in developing countries through the reduction um, of gender inequality by estimates of 2.5 to 4 percent. So therefore, it's really essential that we all ensure that our programming is responsive to the actual situations of both male and female farmers. Um, if agricultural project design does not fully understand these gender gaps and these differences and constraints that are faced by um, men and women, then projects will be less impactful. So recognizing this, Feed the Future has made um, reducing gender inequality and empowering women a key component of its strategy. But in order to do this, we needed a way to measure, understand, and track those differences. And it's to fill that need that the Women's Empowerment in Agriculture Index was created. Designed, developed, and tested for Feed the Future by USAID, the International um, Food Policy Research Institute, or IFPRI, and the Oxford uh, Poverty and Human Development Initiative, or OFI, um, and launched in 2012, the WIA measures women's and men's empowerment and inclusion in the agricultural sector. The WIA is a survey-based index, so it's not based on aggregate statistics or proxy indicators um, or secondary data. It uses interviews of men and women from the same household, asked the same questions um, to robustly capture intra-household and intra-community gender dynamics and um, compare the relative empowerment of women and men within households. The WIA focuses on five standardized domains of empowerment within agriculture, which you'll hear more about later, um, that are designed to be applicable across countries and across contexts. Now, the WIA is an essential component of the Feed the Future monitoring and evaluation system. So for performance monitoring purposes, the WIA is collected every few years in Feed the Future focused countries in order to track changes in relative inclusion of women um, that may be resulting from the initiative's interventions. Um, it's included in a large population-based survey that um, covers a representative sample of the geographic areas where Feed the Future activities are concentrated. So baseline data was collected in 2012 and 2013, um, and a baseline report is available that summarizes results for 13 countries. Um, data collection is currently underway for a second time as part of the Feed the Future interim surveys. Um, and in addition to its use in monitoring, uh, USAID missions have also used the WIA as a diagnostic tool, so utilizing its insights to identify um, the domains where women and men are most disempowered and then designing or adjusting uh, activities to either focus on these areas or devise strategies that um, can overcome the constraints identified. But it's not just USAID who has used the WIA. Um, we are aware of over 40 cases of organizations using the WIA around the globe. 
Um, a Google search has yielded over 16,000 hits for Women's Empowerment in Agriculture Index, including surfacing a study in China that we were not aware of that was using the WIA. So that's kind of neat and shows the, the breadth and the reach of this tool um, in its short lifespan so far. Um, the WIA has been collected, calculated, and analyzed as a variable in impact evaluations, um, as part of gender assessments in project design, um, and in academic research, um, looking at you know, cross-country comparisons of women's empowerment and its linkages to various factors. Um, and these projects have really interestingly modified the WIA in various ways to fit their respective needs. So either you know, choosing only the domains that are the most relevant, adding new domains <laughs> entirely, specializing in existing domains um, to focus on particular crops or interventions. So we are really excited about the proliferation of the WIA. Um, and it's made clear how important it is that the tool is responsive to all of these different purposes, interests, and demands. So with that, today we're going to be are some of the masterminds behind the WIA who have been there since the very beginning, so we are very lucky to have them with us today. And then for the question and answer session, we will be joined by Krista Jacobs, um, a gender advisor here with the Bureau for Food Security. And as Julie mentioned, um, for our webinar participants, Kiara Kovark will be answering questions online um, for our remote participants. So as you listen to our speakers today, I hope you will think about how your USAID mission, your organization, your project could utilize the WIA in any of its various forms um, to improve the design and monitoring of gender inclusion in your own programming. So I encourage you to take this opportunity to ask any and all questions um, during the question and answer session from the minute to the broad that you may have about uh, this tool as well as monitoring and evaluation of gender more broadly. Um, so thank you very much, and with that, I will turn it over to Emily on the phone. All right, can you hear me? I just unmuted. Yes, okay. Thank you. Um, well, hello, everyone. I am uh, glad to be on the phone here with you. I'm sorry I couldn't be there in person, but it seems like we have a pretty good audience on the phone anyway, so... We're joined um, electronically, and, and it's good to be talking to you. Um, I'm My part for today is to take a step back and talk about some background on the Women's Index, walk you through the early life of the index, but in, in, in doing that, talk about sort of all we've been through, all we've learned um, with the index. And to do this, I'm going to use the analogy of having a baby and raising her up through her teenage years. That's about where we feel like she is in terms of, of age. Um, she's grown a little bit in the last few months, so maybe we'll, we'll say she's around 18 or 19, sort of getting close to that 20-year mark. But um, the two images you see on the slide are snapshots of moments in her life. Um, the one on the left is the um, brochure of when we launched the index. Um, uh, initially rolled it out to the public, and the one on the right is the um, the report from the baseline uh, when we we had 13 results from 13 of our focus countries, and and that's sort of farther in towards her adolescence. So I'm going to walk you through the the women's index from conception to adolescence today. Um, as Grace said, I have uh, I've been working on the index since its start. I started with the bureau in um, 
with the Bureau for Food Security in 2010 and when we were in the early stages of um, Feed the Future and creating the monitoring and evaluation system. So I've had um, the joy of working on this project um, now for, for five years and it really has been um, um, it's been a wonder, wonderful opportunity and one of the things that excites me just in the chat box we were seeing several graduate students that were talking about how they're going to use the Women's Index um, in their master's research or their dissertation research and, and seeing that is still just every time we see one more person using it, it's really inspiring um, to, to see how far this has reached and um, what we're able to do in terms of building a community around this. So when I, as I go through the slides, for all the slides there will be an image in the upper right hand corner that will show the stage of life that I'm talking about for the Women's Index in that moment. Um, and it, a little background on why I'm using the analogy. We've used this, those of us on the, what we call the WIA team, those of us that have been working on its development um, since, since its inception. A lot of us, we've, we've worked on it a long time and we really do feel like it is our child. We joke about that, but we've put so much love and time into it and we, we really want to know that we've raised her well and we've brought a, a child into the world that's going to make a contribution to this world. That's a lot of times how we think about it, but it's also a great analogy because um, as is often said, it takes a village to raise a child and many of you have really been part of our upbringing and we can share in that together. Um, so for, um, from the start, um, this is conception as you can see um, from the, uh, the picture in the upper right corner. And I'm going to give you some background on why we decided to conceive. And, and I'll tell you when I was making this, uh, this uh, presentation, um, that was the least racy picture I could get when I Googled images of conception. Okay, so um, that's a little uh, um, explanation of, um, of that image, but it's pretty scientific, so I, I tried to stay with that one. But um, this is some theory behind Feed the Future that sets the stage for why we decided to create this index. Um, so on the right, you see the target-like image, and that's the overall goal of the initiative, um, which is to reduce poverty. Uh, that's one of them. It's to reduce poverty and hunger, but reducing poverty through inclusive agricultural growth. And that was that's one of the goals of the initiative. But how we would do that um, is through, if you look over on the left, there are several boxes. Um, and these are some of the key tenets of Feed the Future. We're going to focus, we focused geographically. We focused on um, increasing productivity in, in a few key value chains in each country where we worked. We were working on national policy reforms, um, leveraging pr the private sector to bring in the private sector resources to ensure sustainability, and then strengthening country systems. And through those, um, those are some of the actions, but um, you know, there are various others. Those are five key ones. Um, we would transform local economies through increased ag productivity, trade, and jobs. But if we were going to transform anything, we, we knew we needed to be inclusive of the populations in those, those local economies. And we would need to include a lot, large number of the actors in the areas where we were working. And women are a big part of that. Um, having an economic growth strategy they're usually over 50% of the population where you're working and making sure that you're engaging women in ways that they are not just in, you're not just increasing their numbers um, and how you're working with them but also the quality of how they're engaging the economy and so that is the um, some of the theory behind where women fit into um, feed the future um, and how we want it to be inclusive in growth um, which takes us to what I'm going to, for this analogy, I'm going to refer to as the family tree. Now, in actuality, if you're familiar, this is the Feed the Future Results framework. But um, you can see where the Women's Index fits in relation to her brother, sister, and cousin indicators. And the Women's Index is in that red explosion-like image there, drawing. Um, she is an indicator for inclusive ag sector growth, which is one of the high-level objectives. Um, but you could see where the other indicators reside. We'll say they're her, like I said, her brother, sister, and cousin indicators. Um, then, um, and those are all in the white boxes for the in the results framework. And then um, you could consider that the objectives under the results framework, which are in the the colored boxes, the blue and the green boxes, those might be the parents and aunts and uncles for the purpose of this analogy. So that's that's where she fits in the family. Um, 
And so that takes us to in utero. We had decided to conceive, and then we have um, we have this baby that we're um, that is is being developed. Um, the first thing we did is USA determined five domains, and those were um, to make a long story short, develop those were. Um, discerned or pulled out of the, the, the strategies for Feed the Future. We looked through the strategies, um, what, what we were intending to do in the, the countries where we were working for Feed the Future. We also did a review of the liter literature, or made sure that, you know how these connected with the literature, and we came up with these five domains, which Grace already named before. After we had the five domains, we started working with um, IFPRI and um, Oxford to um, to, to develop the, the index and the tool, uh, we often call it the WIA team, and that's probably how I'll refer to it if it's referred to again in the presentation. So we developed questionnaires, um, we piloted the instrument, and we constructed the index. Um, and this, this is a large part of what Oxford um, helped us do because they have the they're experts in this methodology that's used. Uh, so within the five domains, we had 10 indicators. You could compare that to uh, the baby's got 10 fingers, 10 toes sort of thing. And then we finalized the Women's Index Survey. And that all happened roughly in, in uh, 2011. So that takes us to the birth of our baby, which was in 2012. Um, WIA, the WIA was launched in February of 2012 at the UN Commission on the Status of Women meetings. Um, there was a, a high-level panel with um, we had part, all of the partners represented, and we also had um, key colleagues from some of the uh, um, the countries where we were working. We had the uh, the Minister of Women and Children's Af um, Affairs from Bangladesh uh, was present as well, um, and that's the brochure for our original launch. Um, right after that, um, well, actually, right around that time, we started collecting. Uh, the index for baselines. And that started in fall of 2011 in Bangladesh, and then it rolled through the other 19 countries from there. Um, so as we, we, developed, or we collected the, the baselines, that took us into um, what I'll compare to the toddler years, and the, the joys and the woes of the toddler years. And for all of you who are parents um, who've had toddlers, um, you will, you will understand and hopefully appreciate this part of the analogy. Um, so to start with the joys, um, we, we had a lot of discovery um, during this period. And one of the things that we quickly discovered is that it, this wasn't just a good monitoring and evaluation tool or a monitoring tool, which is was the original intent, was to track change over time, but that it was also a great diagnostic tool that collected um, some key data for understanding how um, uh, the, the issues and constraints of women's empowerment um, and gender equality in the areas where we were working and gave us more data than a lot of times we ever had for from the gender assessments that we did before programs. Um, so, hold on one second, I'm sorry, I'm having, there's a delay. Um, so, we, we discovered that um, this the use is a diagnostic tool and it was really great. It was like our toddler was learning to count or something. It, there was some um, new skill that our toddler had developed. Um, then we got feedback that um, from a lot of the countries we were working that women respondents felt valued just by having the survey, which was interesting. So it was, it's kind of like our toddler was polite and kind. It was she was well mannered, uh, made people feel happy. Um, and then we we started hearing a lot about how other organizations were starting to um, adapt and adopt the WIA. They were um, they were taking it on and making it um, applicable to their programs. And um, that wasn't something we had originally um, thought a lot about, but it, it, it made sense. Um, and we were very happy that that was happening. And it was like our toddler was inspiring other people to have kids, which is probably the greatest compliment you can have, right, when, you're, when your toddler makes um, other people want to have kids. Um, but then there were some woes. Um, and um, the main woe that we were we were getting at first was we were getting feedback that it was too long. Um, we knew when we, we developed it, it was a pretty pretty um, hefty survey there. It, it, would, um, it wasn't going to take just 10 minutes. Um, so it did take some time and it would take some resources to do. Um, but depending on the situation, um, that could be very problematic. So you know we took that 
um, like our kid was sort of out of shape. Uh, the other kids had to get out of the way when she was coming down the slide because she just it was she was too big and she just wasn't working for some of the in some of the places um, or, or she was posing some problems. Um, then um, there were some questions or dimensions that were problematic. Um, they just didn't work. Sometimes they didn't work in certain contexts. Um, sometimes they were just not, they're not working in a lot of the context, so it wasn't just cultural, it, it was something related to the questions that we needed to refine. So it was like our kid was tough to understand and didn't react well in certain situations. And then the last one was we, we heard um, as you got through data collection that partners had trouble calculating the WIA. It's a complex tool and we know that, um, And um, but that was posing some practical problems. And that, we took that like our kid had a complex psyche that kept people at bay. It, it kept people sort of um, staying away from, from the kid because they couldn't understand her. Um, but those woes stayed with us um, past the toddler years a bit. And we knew we needed to address some of them over the long term. And the last one um, we have largely addressed through the creation of the WIA Resource Center, which is housed at IFPRI, um, that developed materials to support it, helped with, with technical assistance to actually calculate it and provided support to partners. But the first two woes um, were ones we'd need to address through something a bit more invasive. We would have to do something to um, make the, the questionnaire not as long or the, the fielding time not as long and um, we'd have to address some of those problematic questions. So then we got to school age and all of its wonders and those are the you know our first results and um, our child had learned its, her manners. She could cope with her emotions a little better than maybe in the toddler years. And she was off to integrate in the world a bit more. Um, and if you look at the picture in the upper right corner, wouldn't you know it, our kid was a total nerd. But she was, and she was always raising her hand, had to try to answer the question. Um, but despite her intensity, she's still really, really adorable. Um, during this period, we got to see findings from our baseline data um, as they were coming in. And we were learning so much, and it was so amazing, some of the stuff we were seeing. Um, also, partners had adapted the WIA and had results to share of their own. And they had sometimes created new domains and new calculations. And that was something to see um, both con um, substantively with the content about women's the constraints to, to women or how women were engaging in ag, but also understanding methodologically um, and uh, mathematically how the um, how the index could be adapted. And this is when we really started to learn even more from from the WIA. Um, and she brought us home new information every day about the constraints women were facing in different contexts. So then that took us up to adolescence. And all the learning came together and we got a more complete picture of all that the index was and what she could do. And we had the, um, apologies, it didn't for advance. OK, there you go. Um, so the learning came together for a more complete picture. There we go. Um, and um, we had the Women's Index Baseline Report. Um, which we rolled out in May of 2014. And through that, we could communicate findings on women's uh, empowerment um, for 13 countries, but the data were rolling in for, for nearly 20 countries. We had 19 in total that would, we'd have data for. Um, and we had findings like um, the, the greatest constraint on women's empowerment um, uh, in, uh, women's in a, women in agriculture was a lack of access to credit and power over credit-related decisions. Um, excessive workloads or constraints around time use, um, and a low prevalence of group membership, women not really engaged in groups, um, and lacking social capital. Um, another big finding was that you know, constraints um, dominate certain regions, um, like group membership is the primary constraint in Asia, and credit issues are more of a constraint in East Africa, and workload was a greater constraint in southern Africa. Um, and, and one of the things about the index is because we were testing across all of these countries, we could see um, how the, they were socioculturally specific or how they worked out in these different contexts, which um, this was really one of, the, one of the first comprehensive tools that was measuring all these different dimensions on women across so many different contexts. Um, Additionally, we had empirical evidence that um, empowerment was most strongly associated with household education levels and income levels and um, 
maternal behaviors related to nutrition, like dietary diversity um, and, and exclusive breastfeeding. Some of those things we, we already had an idea of, but here was um, em empirical evidence about that. But also some of the, the woes remained that I talked about before. She still didn't fit in anywhere. Um, we still had issues with it being a, a large survey, um, having problems with some of the questions. Um, and she also didn't cover every uh, domain related to empowerment. And there were, for some reason, for some people that didn't, it, it didn't, um, it didn't fit with their programs because there was there was something lacking, and so they had to add to it. Um, and uh, and also that the cost to field the index was too high for many organizations. We had set aside. Uh, USAID had set aside money in our budgets to be able to cover it, but if you really want to do the index, there you do have to to put the resources towards it. So we we wanted to address those, and there was still work to be done, and that that takes us about to the point where we are now. Um, it brings us to the next stage. So what is it going to be? Is it college? Is it a year of finding herself? Or is it going to be the Peace Corps years, which might be a fitting analogy for this crowd? Um, and, and Agnes is going to take us through a little bit of where we are now and, and where this, the, this analogy is going to lead us. Um, but that offers you a bit of background on what we've gone through in, uh, in, in terms of cre uh, maintaining and, and enhancing and developing this tool and the focus that we want to put to certain areas and making this um, a useful tool for a broad, um, a broad community, and um, and and putting forth a tool that's really going to help us improve uh, gender equality and women's empowerment um, through this um, this tool we've developed. So I will stop there and turn it back over. Please start. Okay. Thank you so much, Emily. That was a great um, jumping off point for my talk which is going to be on the next stage, which is projecting where, adapting where for project use and building a community of practice. And um, I only represent, I'm only part of a very large WEA team, Hazel Malapit, Ruth Meisen Dick, Kiara, is on, uh, Kiara Kovar is online, but um, they're all not here physically. Um, Katie Spruill is here, um, and our OFI colleagues as well. And what I'm going to do is give you the tasting menu version of the progress in developing the next stage of WEA. So um, Emily has her childhood um, analogies, and I have my food analogies. So I work for the International Food Policy Research <laughs> Institute. We think of food all the time. So um, many of you in this room are going to be very familiar with WEA, but there, be, there, there may be people who are joining online who may not. So please. Um, forgive me if I go over some of the background which might be repetitive for you, but which I think is necessary so we have a common understanding and grounding as we move forward. So it's really quite a challenge to measure women's empowerment, um, partly because there's so many ways of defining it. We like to use a definition um, put forward by Naila Kabir, which really talks about expanding strategic life choices. But there has actually been a bit of a, um, a backlash against attempts to measure this. And I have been on the receiving end of criticisms that, but you can't measure empowerment. Don't even try. It's so personal. It's so context specific. Um, and I, I agree. It is difficult to measure empowerment. It is very personal. It's very context specific. It's cultural, et cetera. But as a development organization, we have to try to measure it. Because if we cannot measure it, we cannot assess progress against it. And if it is important as an objective, then we have to mo learn how to moni monitor progress, even if such measures may be flawed, or even if such measures are always evolving. So this was, in fact, the rationale for developing the WEA. Um, when I gave a similar presentation at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation a couple of months ago, um, there were those who asked, but is it rigorous? Is it methodologically robust? Did you just pull it out of thin air like a rabbit from a hat? No, we did not. Um, it is very similar to the family of multidimensional 
indices as, as well as the class of indices called the foster greer thorbeck poverty indices, the, the poverty gap, the, the poverty incidence, headcount ratio, all that. They all belong to the same family of indices. But it's quite innovative because it uses interviews of the primary male and primary female adults in the same household, allowing you to look at intra-household differences. And I think what is um, a big step forward is that it focuses on empowerment in agriculture, which is a reproductive, which is a productive domain, in contrast to other indicators of empowerment, which have focused mostly on reproductive domains. So. Um, the details of index construction are in um, an article in World Development by Sabina Alcar and others. Um, and um, there have been actually a number of new peer-reviewed articles which are now coming out on various analytical approaches to looking at how the way are correlates with uh, various outcomes that we are interested in in Feed the Future, such as food security, child nutritional status, maternal nutritional status, and um, um, health and nutrition related behaviors. So let me just go over this very quickly. Um, the way is made up of two sub indices. One sub index is the five domains of empowerment. And the other, and the other index is the gender parity index, which is the woman's achievements relative to the primary male in her household. Um, there are five domains, five fingers. Um, the production domain is made up of Two indicators, input into productive decisions and autonomy in production. The resources domain is made up of three indicators covering asset ownership, purchase, sale, or transfer of assets, access to credit, and decisions on credit. Um, there's only one indicator in the income domain, which is control over the use of income. There are two indicators in the leadership domain, um, whether the person's a group member and speaking in public. And lastly, there are two indicators in the time domain, a perception about whether one has enough leisure, and also a workload indicator, which is based on a 24-hour recall. Now, um, we define empowerment as a woman who has, a woman is empowered if she has achieved adequacy in 80% of more of the weighted indicators. So you basically stack up the indicators. Um, if you are ab at or above the 80% mark, you are defined as empowered. Now, the, because we want to look at empowerment relative to men, um, we have a gender parity index, which reflects two things, the percentage of women who enjoy gender parity. So a woman has, in, in, has gender parity or achieves gender parity if she's empowered, or if her score is equal to or greater than the score of the primary male in her household, as well as the empowerment gap, which is the average percentage shortfall that a woman without parity experiences relative to the male in their household. Now, so that was sort of the background. Now, moving forward, um, Emily has mentioned that a lot, of, a lot of organizations are making a lot of adaptations to the WEA. And in a sense, it's like making the perfect omelet, which is probably suitable for this time of our seminar, which is around breakfast, brunch time. So there are many variations of an omelet, but all omelets have eggs. Um, and so one, I'm going to discuss two omelet types today. One is the abbreviated WEA, which we call the AWEA, which was developed partly to meet um, the need of, of people who want to have a more nimble instrument. They were complaining about um, the, the long time it takes to administer the instrument. And the second one is the project level WEA, or the pro WEA. And this arose because of a need by projects to find something that is more suitable um, to their particular context because agricultural de um, development projects, for example, are quite diverse. They might have different focuses, whether it's a crop project or a livestock project. And many organizations have, in fact, already adopted the original way to fit a specific program or project by adding or removing indicators and domains or changing the wording of questions. So for example, a lot, some of the Care Pathways project in its India um, site really tried to look at the issue of mobility, which is a very important constraint to women's empowerment in some cultures, but perhaps not in others. So the question is, how far can these adaptations go and still have a way? Or when is it no longer an omelet? Um, so I'll, I'll give you two examples. One is that I've in, in the process of reviewing papers on WEA or students who are working on WEA, 
um, I've read stuff which says I'm worried I'm using the way in my analysis and I look at it no you're not using the way you're using some of the questions from the questionnaire you're not collecting all the domains so it's way inspired it's not really a way um, and I guess my analogy there is like um, I had a son I have a son who used to be allergic to eggs and I, I would make vegan scrambles for him you know to a tofu scramble with turmeric to make it yellow, but it wasn't fooling anyone. It wasn't a real omelet. <laughs> it was yummy, but um, you know, it wasn't an omelet. So the point is that if you're going to do some adaptation, you're going to have some problems with standardization and comparability. So for USAID, for example, who's looking at a whole range of projects in different countries, if each project made its own tweak, at some point, you may have difficulty comparing your, the projects across your portfolio. To what extent is one project doing better than the other in closing empowerment gaps if the metrics have changed so much that you can no longer call it aware? So with that in mind, we first tried to address the issue of it's really too long. So that was the motivation behind creating the AWEA, the abbreviated WEA. So the goal of USAID was to streamline the survey, um, to reduce administration time by about 30%, and to improve modules that were difficult to administer in the field. And these were um, the time use module, the autonomy in production module, the credit module, and speak in public. Um, the process of doing this was that um, the IFRI team, working with the USAID team and the OFI team, developed a pilot, a pilot questionnaire um, between 2013 and early 2014. Um, we conducted cognitive testing, which is really a, a, a very systematic methodology using qualitative interviews to find out whether respondents actually understand what you are asking. Are you getting across? Um, pilot field work was conducted in the summer of 2014 in Bangladesh and Uganda, and Katie here was involved in the Uganda pilot and Kiara in the Bangladesh pilot. And then this year, early this year, we analyzed the data from the pilot. And we have come up with a version of the WEA with six indicators and streamlined questions. Note that we have five domains. I want to show you a, a, a table in the, next, um, in the next slide. And this is a version which can be used by USAID, other donors, and potentially by national statistical systems for household service. So if you were going to compare, for example, the original WEA and the A WEA, the original WEA has five domains and 10 indicators. The AWEA still has five domains, but it has now six indicators. So four, um, uh, four indicators were dropped. So the autonomy in production indicator was dropped. It was turned out to be a bit difficult to implement in the field, although now that we're using vignettes, it's, it's much easier to implement. Um, the indicator on purchase, sale, or transfer of assets was dropped because it's highly correlated with ownership. So they were practically capturing the same thing. The speaking in public um, question was dropped because it was problematic in countries where you could be um, at risk if you spoke out in public. And so people were not necessarily forthcoming about whether they spoke in public or not. Um, and lastly, the leisure, the leisure question was also dropped because it was kind of subjective. And um, we actually got a lot more mileage out of just using the workload, uh, the workload instrument based on 24-hour recall. Know that, the, that for comparability purposes, the original WEA is being collected in the interim survey. Um, so very, just to go over the pros of the A WEA, so we were able to reduce administration time by about 30%. It doesn't call, include some of the more problematic modules from the original survey. And of course, you want to know how comparable are the results. So when comparing it using the second pilot data, the top two constraints contributing to men's and women's disempowerment remain the same, group membership and workload. The cons, of course, is that if you want to look at 10 indicators, it would only cover six. Um, it would only be comparable to the original baseline if you restrict your analysis to the six indicators. So you would do an indicator by indicator analysis. And when comparing to the original way I used the second pilot data, one of the top three indicators changed, which is a credit indicator. But this could also be because of the way credit was asked in the baseline. 
The big caveat here is that the pilots are based on small samples of about 350 to 400 households in two countries. So the results are only indicative. And even in the original pilots in, 2012, in 2011, when we compare that to, for example, a nationally representative or the whole uh, Feed the Future um, PBS, the, the results would necessarily be different because you're looking at really very different sample sizes. So this is something that needs to be taken into account. Um, there will be a webinar next week, September 23, where Hazel Malapit, who is really involved with the nitty gritty of implementing and using the area. And at that webinar, um, the following resources will, will be released, uh, the new AWEA questionnaire. So it's, basic, it's very similar to the old AWEA questionnaire, except that some of the ambiguity in some of the questions have been removed. It's shorter. Um, the ordering is a bit different. There are some clearer response codes. Um, there is an enumerator's manual and an instructional guide. So if you have any questions, any detailed questions about AWEA, I suggest that you hold on to them, write them down, don't forget them, and ask Hazel about them next week. Um, and then, I want to, so I want now to turn to the challenge of trying to, to adapt where to project use and still maintain comparability. So you mentioned earlier that there was, you were very happy about this proliferation of WEA users. I'm not particularly happy because some of them have not been very rigorous in documenting how different the WEA is from the original WEA. And as I said, I have reviewed enough student papers where the only thing common to the WEA is the name. When I look at the indicator, like, what in the world is this? <laughs> so is it WEA if you modify the survey instrument? Yes, it can still be a WEA. You have five indicators, and some five domains, same indicators. Um, is it a way if you drop or add indicators? Possibly, as long as you keep the five domains. And um, you can still compute, even, even if you add a domain, you can still compute a comparable way by restricting your analysis to five indicators. But believe me, there has been so much adaptation that sometimes it's very difficult to, to compare. So how to choose among these flavors of WEA? So there is a WEA version stable, which displays the four variations of WEA. There's the original WEA, there's the abbreviated WEA, it talks about the pro-WEA, and ad hoc adaptations. Now, I must point out that pro-WEA isn't even on the menu yet. Okay, It is under development. And it should capture what projects want from WEA. They want more streamlined, easier to collect indicators that can be part of regular M&E. They want it to be more adaptable to project context. They want to understand better the qualitative aspects of empowerment, how and why. And depending on the particular context, some projects might be interested in mobility, gender-based violence, reproductive health, self-confidence, political participation, etc. Some of these are now outside the agriculture purview of the Feed the Future program. But if we want other organizations to take this up, they must be able to use it, and it must be able to fit their needs. So for example, depending on the project, they might want more detail on control and ownership of livestock, and less detail in others, like crops, and the reverse for crop projects. It might extend beyond agriculture. It might look at autonomy in different spheres. So for example, control over income or participation in the labor force might be a more telling area of women's autonomy compared to decision on what crops to grow. Sometimes people say, well, we've always planted that crop, so there's really no autonomy involved. And ability to tackle dimensions of empowerment that relate to health and nutrition outcomes. So the issue here is how, if you're, especially if you're a large donor organization, a large portfolio, how can you have comparability across your different projects? And how do you know what strategy works best to empower women if the metrics are different? So this means that you need to have an approach, which is a portfolio approach to testing and developing this new indicator. Fortunately, um, IFPRI has experience in the Gender, Agriculture, and Assets Project, which is funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and which has now recently been funded, for which a second phase has been funded precisely to develop a pro -air. 
So it builds on the approach that it, has, it will be working with a portfolio of projects in South Asia and Africa in focused countries. It will work with agricultural development projects to develop a, a way of a project use, which we call the PROWEA. The projects will be invited to submit applications for participation in a, in a portfolio depending on their commodity focus or the objective. And I was asked to mention that project means something in USAID speak, so it covers both projects and activities. Those of you from USAID will know what that means. I don't. <laughs> so basically, we want to populate the four cells of that matrix. Um, this project, this gender agriculture and assets project phase two, is being supported by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. It's also supported by USAID and the Consortium Research Program on Agriculture for Nutrition and Health. So what we want to do using a portfolio approach is to develop comparable metrics for empowerment across different types of commodities and project objectives. The GAP2 team will work with projects to develop standardized add-on modules. So if we have, for example, a mobility module, it should be standardized so it can be adaptable, used by different countries, but of course with room, always with room for adaptation. And these modules will be adjusted to a core set of original WEA modules, or A-WEA modules, measuring other domains of women's empowerment. Um, we are also setting up a WEA community of practice. Um, and a community of practice is both a physical and a virtual facilitated network of projects, implementers, researchers, M&E specialists, etc. It's based everybody who's interested, whether implement on an implementation side, M&E side, research side. And the, prod, the gain from joining a COP is that we found in gap one that the projects were actually learning from each other, but we didn't provide them the space to interact outside our regular meetings. So we're hoping to have um, a virtual community as well, an opportunity to share experiences, questions, and insights. And it will be facilitated by professional collaboration facilitators, um, with radical inclusion, and it will include webinars, virtual conferences, online tools, and to be housed at the WEA Resource Center at IFPRI. So a call to join the Pro WEA COP has been posted on the GAP website. And um, Farsana and Emily have, I think, disseminated this to your partners. There are two levels of the call, call to join the community of practice. It's open to all interested. Just give us some information about your project. And the second part of the call is to join a call to join the GAP2 portfolio to help develop ProWea for the project clusters defined above. We can only fund um, 10 from GAP2, but the portfolio will consist of 10 to 14 projects, some to be funded by the respective donors. And um, the deadline for USAID partners is October 2. Um, Farsan and Emily said that they will answer questions from USAID partners. Um, I guess the analogy here is that those who are chosen for the GAP2 portfolio based on the, their applications are the ones who are actually going to be in the test kitchen. It's like joining Chopped or who's a new food network star. Whereas the rest in the community of practice can just browse online and use the recipes after they've been developed or send in comments as the recipes are being developed. So the criteria um, are in the call, but I'm going to go over them briefly in case people here want more information. They should be located in the following focus countries. Now, if your project is not in the fo a focus country, but it really has some particular innovation, then make the case in your application. Um, it should fit in one of the project categories, either a horticulture crop project or livestock dairy project with a value chain or income objective or improved nutrition health objective should try to empower women. It should have a rigorous M&E plan. Um, we should, the project people should be eager to collaborate with us and be active participants in the community of practice. You have to be able to fit in two rounds of data collection, um, ideally with enough intervening time to detect impacts. So two rounds of data collection of the ProWEA modules. Um, this would mean, basically, if our inception workshop is in January of 2016, um, being ready to go to the field for a baseline or first round of ProWEA by March or April of 2016. And all the projects invited to submit pro full proposals must demonstrate that they meet the criteria. But which projects are ultimately selected depends on the composition of the overall portfolio. OK. 
Okay, so the top takeaways from, from this um, quick tasting menu is first that measuring women's empowerment is necessary for monitoring progress in, a gender, in addressing gender issues in agriculture and food security programming. If we can't measure, we can't monitor. Um, secondly, there are different versions of the WEA which are available to serve different purposes. Choose the one that fits your need. And if the one that fits your need isn't on the menu, then join us and help us develop it. So um, thank you very much for listening in, and I look forward to questions. Great. Thank you so much to our presenters. We have about half an hour available for questions and answers, so we hope that you will ask plenty of questions, either specifically about the WIA, or it's all right to ask questions more generally about monitoring evaluation for gender integration in agriculture. So we'll take some from in the room and also a couple from online, but I'll start here in the room. And um, please state your name and organization if you don't mind. Thanks, Julie. <clears throat> Judy Kanawati from the Office of Food for Peace. Um, I, it's a very welcome development. Uh, one of the big constraints our partners found when they tried to apply the way I was, of course, the time it took mm -hmm. and how long it was. And we already had a long survey that we were adding it on to. Um, <clears throat> what I'm wondering about this new pro way I is m about multi-sectoral programs. As you know, Food for Peace is a long time multi-sectoral programming where we have value chain or, or, or dairy components, income objectives, as well as nutrition health outcomes. And if you look at the USAID multi-sectoral nutrition strategy of which BFS mm -hmm. is a part, um, we really are talking about agricultural growth right. as well as improvement in nutritional status. So it already is multi-sectoral in, in its conceptual framework. So I'm wondering, in the, in the gap to requirements, it's income, uh, dairy, livestock, or nutrition outcome. What about programs that have both? Mm -hmm. uh, would they be eligible? Yes, to participate? that's a short answer. Um, and I forgot to mention, Krista, if you'd like to head up to the front to help answer some questions, um, please feel free. And Emily, we welcome you to, to jump in as possible. We might also call on you um, for the Q&A. But if you have something to say, don't hesitate to jump in. We can hear you. Hear it. Oh, OK, and I will, I'm going to stop looking at the chat box then, because it does distract my attention. So I will focus on the questions for now. Great. Um, do we have an online question to bring up, or should we take one more one? All right, we'll send to our online audience for a question. Yes. So we've had a very active. Can you hear me? Okay. We've had a very active online audience. A lot of people have been asking very technical questions, which has been great to have Emily online to help answer those. Um, but one question for the room. This is from uh, Hiritika Rana. I apologize if I mess up your name. Um, she wants to know, is it possible to use the WIA as a tool to compare women's empowerment between women involved in more traditional crop production versus non-traditional export or commercial cash crops? How do you want to do this? You want to take a group Toss of questions? Toss it up to the front. Then... Um, should we, do we want to do a group of questions or one by one? We're happy to do either. Okay, um, so I can start in response, and Agnes, Grace, feel free to jump in. So I think it would be very interesting, and certainly the pro WIA would be open to cash crops. Um, there are several cash crop value chains in Feed the Future as well, so I think it's definitely a possibility. You would have to do some, some playing with your sample size. Mm -hmm. um, to understand, to be able to compare women in one country, in one context, who are doing cash crops with those doing subsistence crops. And you also always have the very real possibility of people doing both. Great. 
Great. Uh, do we have another question or comment to share about how you experienced um, some of these programs in your own work? I'll pass it off to Judy. I'm Judy Payne from USAID um, Bureau of Food Security ICT Advisor for Ag. I'm not an expert on gender nor an m and &E, but I'm very happy to know a lot more about that index. I, my question is um, based on the comment at the very beginning about empowerment increasing productivity by 30% or something, something amazing. Um, how do we know that? And is that holding other resources constant? And have we seen that actually in some Feed the Future countries? I <laughs> I'll, I'll answer that. I think technically, um, so these were simulations which were done by FAO um, based on estimates of productivity differences or yield gaps between men's plots and, or, and women's plots, ba basically by surveying the empirical literature. So it's not empowerment. It is equalizing the resources which are um, applied by men and women farmers, so fertilizer, education, credit has, it's basically equalizing that. And so the, the FAO folks will say that it is a back of the envelope calculation. Um, there have been more rigorous empirical studies using the ISA, ISA, LSMS ISA surveys, which were just released in um, a special issue of agricultural economics. And the yield gaps actually range, they're quite large. I mean, some of them cluster around 20%. But they differ by crop and by country, so it's actually quite contextual. So I think the the information that provides is like a big overview, but you really need, I think for the purpose of programming, you would need to go at the country level and look at the gaps are in, in what specific crops. And that's one of the reasons that we're very excited just starting in this past year to have more sex disaggregated gross margins and yields data in our Feed the Futures programs so we can see by crop and by country. So we're just starting to be able to answer that question a couple years down the road. I wanted to say something um, about the nutrition program question, though. I don't remember who asked that. Um, you had asked, um, you had, I think it was Judy from Food for Peace who asked that question. Um, you had mentioned, so. I asked, I, asked her the, I answered the simple question, which was, so what about programs which have both income and nutrition? Of course, they can, they can you know, participate and help to develop new indicators. But I think the important thing about recognizing the nutrition objective is that there may be things outside agriculture which affect a woman's or man's ability to empowerment in, to affect nutritional outcomes. So some of them may have to do with... Um, you know, reproductive health, freedom from gender-based violence, uh, um, whether you're able in, for example, in an extended household to command resources or you have to hand over everything to your mother-in-law. So a lot of it's very contextual. So this means that the effort in developing these indicators that focus on nutritional outcomes will have to be done together with nutritionists as well. And the GAP2 team does have nutritionists on board. So. We're, quite, we're actually quite excited about this possibility. Hi, thanks. I'm Faustine Wabuina with Bread for the World. I just wanted to thank you very much for the insights you've shared. Um, we, Bread for the World released its 2015 hunger report. It was empowering women in agriculture. And one of the things we really studied exactly the we are to help us make that argument for that when women flourish, we can end hunger. And as we visited some of the countries that we highlighted in the report, some of the issues you talked about today, especially on perceptions, mm -hmm. um, really came up. I remember this one woman in Malawi who said uh, the fact that she does not speak in public has nothing to do with the fact that her husband you know, mm -hmm. prevents her from doing so. Um, mm -hmm. and neither did she necessarily feel it was cultural, it's just personality, like some of us in this room might not feel comfortable speaking in public, I might be one of them. Um, but, but so I was actually thrilled to see that that indicator drop because we, we struggle with articulating yeah. that. 
Um, and also that speaks to the issue of since you're just looking at the relationship between men and the female and male in the same mm -hmm. household, in the event that you found that a man felt equally disempowered or if you ask uh -huh, a male uh -huh. who said they, they didn't feel empowered, what do you do with that kind of information? Um, and my quick last question is, has there been any interest from some of the governments for the future countries that are seeing the value of the findings from the WEA and adopting those maybe in their own national government policies? Or is it too early? It's not too early. Good. <laughs> Um, hey, Julie, I'd like to jump in, especially on the last question, um, but also on the, the earlier ones. But um, um, we definitely have already engaged with the government of Bangladesh. They had specific questions from very high levels about what the findings were from the Women's Index. Um, and um, so that's one case. There may be other cases that, that haven't gotten back to us about um, the, the use of the data, but we do know that specifically in Bangladesh there was already great interest. Um, and we also have an interest in promoting it because um, we're not sure always that the the, the data are have reached um, the, the highest level or the ministerial level where we might might want to make sure that they're aware that we collected the data and we're, we're analyzing it. But that is a part of what we wanted to do through the abbreviated WIA is create a tool that was perhaps more streamlined and can be used for national level surveys. And we're working with the World Bank and FAO now to um, determine where we might be able to fit the women's index in to one of the living standards and measurement studies integrated surveys in ag. So um, stay tuned for that, but we are trying to um, integrate the, the abbreviated WIA um, in one of the countries um, where we are, we will probably help to fund the collection of the, of the ISA survey. So I, I also wanted to answer your question about what do you do if you find out that men are disempowered. I think it's a very important finding because um, agricultural development projects have to try to reach all farmers, male and female. And often, if you don't address issues of male disempowerment, it may have a backlash for the women in their households. So we were quite interested, for example, to see that um, in Bangladesh, for example, group membership was a constraint of both men and women. Speaking in public was a constraint of both men and women. So you, there are some aspects of empowerment, of disempowerment, which affect both and I think should be addressed by, by programming. And I'm really glad that Emily brought out this, um, the receptivity of the government of Bangladesh to the way of findings. They have, so IFPRI has been working closely with them through a USAID-supported um, policy research strategy and support program. And so they have really been very engaged in using the findings to ask us to help them evaluate some new pilot programs for more gender sensitive agriculture. One other thing I wanted to comment on, sorry, was because there were several questions in there, but was about the speaking in public indicator, because I know we've gotten feedback about, but you know, that wasn't the right indicator. I, um, and a couple of things related to that. It may not have been, we may not have had the right questions in there, but it still is an extremely important dimension in terms of women having voice. And it's not just about whether her husband lets her speak in public. That's not really the point. There are structural constraints that have to do with the community and the overall society that can limit, limit women's voice. It may not have anything to do with her, with her husband directly. But that's part of what we were trying to get at as well, that do women, is the, um, the way that the, you know, the social dynamics are um, impacting the voice and, and communication of women, are women actually able to speak up about issues that matter? So it still is a very important dimension. Um, we just may not have had the questions exactly right, um, especially for this survey. Um, but it is something that I think that should be measured. We should continue to look for ways to measure it. And particularly in a project level adaptation of the WIA, um, that may be extremely important to the program. And you would want to want to test some ways to get at that um, dimension a little better. Great questions and comments. Thank you. And thank you for the answers. Um, we'll toss it back to our online audience for a question. 
So Sarah Mills has a question for the panel. She says, I'm interested to know about experiences of including questions pertaining to violence and self-esteem on empowerment. Does anybody from the panel have something to, to talk about in that regard? It has not been included in any of the WEA um, questions because it was outside the domain of agriculture. But the people who have experience in doing this are the people who work on reproductive health and the demographic and health surveys. Um, so maybe people in the room who have experience can talk, can talk about that. But and also I think with the creation of the WEA, there was a deliberate choice for what do we need to be looking at and what is missing in terms of women's empowerment in agriculture? There are lots of other yeah. indicators that are, I would say, sometimes more regularly collected than some of, the, some of the indicators within the WIA. So we didn't think we would be adding anything. We didn't think we would be filling a big gap um, since we were addressing women's empowerment in agriculture by adding in the self-esteem and the GBV as part of the WIA, while yes, they are certainly relevant to women's empowerment in general and agriculture, there were already ways of doing that that had been developed and validated. Uh, yes, <clears throat> Sarah Lucia Durso with NCDA CLUSA. I was just wondering with your baseline what your experience was in dealing with responses and uh, surveying polygamous households and impact on multiple wives and how that might affect their empowerment. The way that the sampling was done for the WIA was within one household, a primary male, the primary male decision maker and the primary female decision maker were interviewed. So it was only one man and one woman per household. And it was kind of the self-identified primary female and male decision maker. So that would be, we wouldn't have information, we would only have information on one wife's empowerment. We would be aware that there are other wives in the household and we could see, you know, given that you are in a polygamous household, is your empowerment any different? But I don't think there'd be information on so. which wife you would be. So we couldn't go that deep into it. It's an interesting thing to, to do, but it wasn't in the baseline. And I think um, different countries treated the sampling different, though, because there were some contexts, and I'd ha I, I can't remember which one. We've had email conversations with several missions, but there are missions where the cultural context distinguished that, that the household included all of the different wives, and there were other contexts where the diff there were different households, depending on if, if you use the definition that we had in the survey for what constitutes a household, which is people eating from the same pot, where actually they, they did not all eat from the same pot, so therefore they were distinct households, and it might have affected the sampling strategy. We do have some things written up on that. I can't remember it all right now, but we've, we've addressed this question, um, and I know Kiara has a lot of information on it as well, so that might be something we could follow up on in writing. Interesting. Thanks, Emily. All right, we'll pass it. Um, thank you very much. My name is Karine Garnier. I'm with the USAID Center for Resilience. And my question um, is uh, about uh, if you know of experience using the WEA with pastoralist communities. I know Ilri has used the WEA in Kenya, but I remember it being with a more high potential area. Um, but maybe there is other examples uh, in the world. And just maybe to refer for the, the earlier question about uh, the difference in productivity, the FAO State of Food and Agriculture uh, released in 2011 has a lot of more details comparing different crops and uh, different uh, contexts. So for pastoralists, I don't know of anything specific to pastoralists. I know that we have um, our Sahel group, who you probably know better than I do. I've met them a few times in Dakar. I know that they have recently done a survey which included at least part of the WIA. I don't know that it included all of it. So that would probably be the, 
the closest thing to a pastoralist heavy. Um, no, we have we have uh, what we did in Ethiopia. Um, the um, the survey that the population based survey in Ethiopia included um, the pastoralist populations, and what was done in Kenya as well did the the northern PBS. All right, we'll toss it back to our online audience and then get a couple more here. We have a question from Kashi Kafel. Question is, is women's empowerment an outcome or a pathway to achieve a well-being outcome? That's a really great question. I'll, I'll jump in and then Krista, as a gender expert, um, if you want to say a little bit more about it for for the future, but it definitely we have considered it both an outcome in and of itself. Um, empowerment um, is it's a social outcome. It um, is related to um, um, social well-being, um, being empowered, and seeing equality in society. But it also is, and if you look in our results framework, it is a step. Um, it's a way of measuring inclusive ag growth, which is getting us towards poverty reduction and hunger reduction. So um, it is, we would consider it both. We do, for Feed the Future, it really was essential because of trying to reach that top level goal, but we, we recognize the value of, of empowerment of both men and women for the sake of empowerment and what it, what it can mean for the community and the society. Hello, my name is Yasmin Nchampwan. I'm a student at Brandeis University and also an intern at IFPRI. Um, so my question is for projects that are more um, interested in the interplay between climate change and agriculture, what is your impression of um, where the WIA stands right now? Is it a useful tool for, for these kinds of projects or is the pro-WIA a more useful tool? The, the pro-WIA doesn't exist yet. Yes. So, so by definition, it's more useful. No, but but I think that to make let's let's say let's look at the issue of climate change. Um, you would have to develop modules surrounding um, knowledge and practice of climate smart agricultural techniques, which are not in the current way. So, um, I think that this is a good example, actually, in terms of project adaptation, which is to perhaps de develop some very specific modules which are related to particular activities and outcomes that your project wants to try to achieve. So um, some of the existing WEA modules or indicators are going to be very highly correlated with climate change um, adaptation. For example, whether you have control over resources, whether you can make decisions about agricultural production. But there may also be some specific practices which are not captured, and that, that's probably going to end up being developed in an add-on module, which can be part of your specific project, but for comparability purposes might not be included in um, comparisons with other projects. And I think in addition to the two that Agnes mentioned, time use and workload is something that as you do you know, climate smart agriculture, is that increasing or decreasing the amount of time you're spending? How is it affecting your allocation? And also, how is climate change itself perhaps affecting women's and men's time, time allocations? And can your project start to see some of those shifts? Um, my name is Justin Schweigel. I'm working on the land topic and enabling business of agriculture project at the World Bank. And I was just wondering. Um, Hearing some of the responses about certain things are just related to cultural practices and uh, societal pressures. I was wondering, those seem difficult to change through specific policy reforms. And if, if uh, I was curious if the indicators and questions were designed with policy reform in mind. And if so, I heard there, you know, there has been interest in Bangladesh to, to their scoring or their um, performance on these indicators. And, are they addressing the specific policy reforms that were envisioned, if that's the case? Any insights from our... I'll let Agnes and Grace talk about Bangladesh. <laughs> I'll make one point. So we know that there, 
especially around land and assets and property, there's not sufficiently stand there's not sufficient information period in terms of does data exist and it's also not standardized and with the rigor that we would need and this is a global issue in women's property rights so i think one contribution of the wea while it might not have been intended to influence land policy because it is a way to start to get that information on ownership access and control it can definitely make a contribution just because now people can have the numbers in front of them. Yeah, I would say the way it definitely was not intended as um, a tool to drive specific policy reforms, but rather provide information that then could be used to kind of determine priorities and determine where, where reform or policy reform efforts should be focused. Um, but to your point about kind of the how difficult it is to change some of these things through policy, and then also the how long it takes to, to have policy reform. I think there has been an, an acknowledgement that the, the WIA results will definitely kind of need to take some time to reflect some of these outcomes that may have been generated through some of, of the insights gathered, and that we can't necessarily ex expect to see changes, you know, within a few years when we collect the, the WIA data. Uh, well, we only have about five minutes left. I think we can probably squeeze in two more questions, but I just wanted to ask everyone um, to fill out the surveys on your seats before you leave. They just help us improve these events for next time. So any comments you want to fill in or opinions about you know, what you like, what you don't like about our Ag Sector Council seminars, uh, that's very helpful to us. said, in areas with high out migration of men, what other modifications would you propose for the WIA? I do know the China study actually that we found in um, the Google search looks at effects on women's decision making. Um, as a result of some of the, the migrations of men into urban areas in China. Um, but I think that they should go to Agnes's point about adapting the WIA in such a way that it might not be an omelet anymore. Um, I think that because they were more looking at women specifically and not the, the women and men comparison, um, it, it may lose some of that essential way in it. But. So um, let, let me answer this question actually quite specifically because we did Hazel and I actually work on a study in Nepal, which also has very high rates of out-migration. So in our analysis, we ended up um, doing analysis separately for households with male, with male out-migrants and households where men were, were co you know, co-resident. Um, and in, in many cases, we ended up just looking at the five DE, the five dimensions of women's empowerment, rather, rather than the complete way, uh, precisely because of the very high um, proportion of male out migration. Nevertheless, we did get a lot of very important findings out of just analyzing um, the, um, the women's 5DE. The other thing that is also interesting to, to look at, and we did not have enough information to do this in Nepal, is to look at what if you have a senior woman and a junior woman. So for example, in many of these areas where men out migrated, the mother-in-law was present, and we didn't have sufficient information to look into that dynamic, but I'm sure it would, it would be quite interesting to go back and look at this qualitatively. But that could be an example where if you know that where you're going to be working does have a high proportion of male-out migrants, that you can, in a pro wea kind of setting, ask questions about who else in the household is making decisions. Are the decisions we need to be asking about any different? Anya Madalinska from CNFA, and um, my question is about uh, the pro WIA, looking ahead to the pro WIA, and thinking about adapting um, the WIA to project-specific um, design and the different beneficiaries that exist in projects. So uh, a project with a women's empowerment, um, with a women's empowerment component, might have 
different levels of beneficiaries, the way in which the activities actually direct mm -hmm. affect the beneficiaries, whether they're more direct or less direct. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering how that affects the sampling for the surveys, from which level is the um, sample selected? So I think that's going to depend on um, the project's own M&E plan. So I think the project might want to... So some projects are going to have very well-developed impact evaluation plans, and that will really help you try to tease out impacts. Um, some of them may only have um, following people who are currently in the program. And what I actually would urge um, project people is really to make an effort to follow the same individuals through time, even, even after they've left the program. Because many times, um, projects make the mistake only of finding out about people who are currently in the program and not those who have left. So if you, for example, let's say that you have people who are currently in the program they're, they, and they become empowered, they leave the program. Then the next, next year, you do a survey of the people who are currently in the program who just started the program. So they're going to end up looking worse. It's like as if your empowerment is going down through time. It's, but it's because you're not, because you're looking at a cohort of new people. And so you really, I've seen this many times in a lot of you know, smaller organizations which don't think the, these measurement issues through. And so I think that um, implementers need to work with their M&E folks to really figure out what's the best way of tracking progress as a result of the program. Okay, well with that, I will go ahead and wrap things up. Thank you so much to our wonderful presenters for everything you've shared today. Um, thank you to the KDAD project for managing the webinar and all the logistics and kind of elements for this seminar. And most importantly, thank you to all of you who attended in person and online. Um, we really appreciate your attendance and your feedback. And um, we encourage you to always stay engaged with agrilinks.org. Everyone here is invited to share information through that website, through that platform, to help reach other ag development practitioners. It's open to uh, everyone in the ag development space. If you have any questions about it, come see me. And uh, please take any food that is remaining outside. We don't want to have any leftovers. So we'll see you next month, hopefully. Thank you.